Good afternoon, everyone. Um, welcome. My name is Heather Conley. I'm Senior Fellow and Director of the Europe Program here at CSIS. If this is the first time you're visiting us, welcome to our new building. We're delighted to have you here. And I can't uh, begin to tell you how delighted I am that we have the return of Ambassador Andreas Mavroyanis, uh, Permanent Secretary of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Cyprus. Um, Former, former, but now, now, <laughs> he's got a bigger title. Are you ready for it? Greek Cypriot negotiator, negotiator for the Cyprus problem. That's a daunting title. I, I have to, I have to confess. Um, the minister was here two years ago, a year and a half ago, uh, visited CSIS uh, with another tough job. He was in charge of, uh, of, of, of the rotating presidency which C Cyprus held uh, for the European Union. So we were talking about European Union budgets and uh, multi-annual financial frameworks. So that, that conversation has moved on and now an even tougher assignment. To introduce the minister, it might be shorter to say what he has not done in a distinguished diplomatic career than to run through this uh, extraordinary list of, of accomplishments. The minister, the ambassador has served as uh, uh, ambassador uh, of Cyprus to Ireland, to France, to the United Nations. Uh, he has worked on every difficult problem that the United Nations has faced. Uh, again, his EU credentials are extraordinary, but now perhaps, he comes to his toughest, most difficult challenge uh, and an, at an exciting moment where we could see 40 years after Cyprus was divided, a potential reunification. The ambassador is going to share some comments with us, some reflections on where the process stands, uh, uh, negotiating process to reunify Cyprus. And then we're gonna have a little uh, moderated conversation here and then we'll open the floor to questions uh, and to comments and, and answers. So again, Mr. Ambassador, we are so delighted you are here. We are so delighted that with every job you get you seem to take on the tough assignments and you seem to solve them. So we're really hoping you can solve this one. So with that, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Heather. And uh, I would like to thank everybody who spared time to be here with us today. Uh, okay. Uh, it's uh, a pleasure to come back and uh, be gone. Uh, I would... Uh, say that uh, two years ago, it was two years ago That's in true. April, uh, we were talking, uh, you know, about the European Union. Cyprus was about to assume the rotating uh, presidency of the Council of the European Union, and uh, we had a very uh, daunting agenda at the time with all the MFF negotiations and many other issues. But uh, I think you are at the same time that you are absolutely right this uh, current uh, challenge I'm facing is uh, much more difficult than uh, anything else I, I did in my life. So, so uh, uh, it was uh, an offer I couldn't refuse, but uh, I have to tell you that uh, I will do, of course, uh, myself my best and my utmost, but uh, uh, for the, a solution to happen in Cyprus after so many years, uh, after the uh, invasion of 74, uh, it requires uh, not only commitment and determination by everybody, but also, uh, as uh, they were saying in Ireland, and I was there during the Good Friday Agreement, you know, you need that the stars align themselves well. So maybe this time round, this will happen in Cyprus as well. So um, let, let me uh, make a kind of an introduction to our subject, and uh, then uh, I will be open, of course, to all uh, questions and comments that uh, you will be willing to, to provide us. Uh, you know, I think that we need today, if we talk about uh, the prospects for a settlement in Cyprus, to put a bit things into perspective 
and into a broader perspective. Since 1974, uh, uh, we were trying to find a settlement in Cyprus which uh, will accommodate the concerns and the preoccupations of both communities, but which at the same time would, uh, uh, if you like, reunify the country and allow it to fully take its stride as a modern democratic society. In the late 70s, there was uh, an initial understanding uh, about having a federal solution in Cyprus. This uh, was uh, the uh, result of uh, the division in the situation which co was created in 74, mm -hmm. and the only way that we felt at the time, both communities, that we could move forward. Eventually, this notion of a federation uh, was uh, further elaborated to to embrace the idea of a bicommunal, bizonal federation with political equality between the two communities in Cyprus and uh, with uh, effective participation of both communities at the federal level, but safeguarding at the same time the single international personality, the single sovereignty, and the single citizenship of Cyprus. The Cypriots were not used to the idea of uh, federation, and until today, uh, it's not very easy to explain that uh, the federation, it's a different system than a unitary state. And uh, if we are talking about the federation, it is because we all realize that the consociational uh, character of the Cyprus society has to be fully taken on board in order to uh, make something that will be workable. Otherwise, we don't stand a chance to find a settlement for the Cyprus problem. And the federal structure has to be based on this substract, if you like. Uh, for us, under those conditions, the most important thing is we, that we have an organization of the state structure, the federal and the constituent state level, in a way that will ensure the functionality of the state. Of course, we need it to be inclusive uh, for all its citizens, and we need to have an integrated economy and society. We don't want that uh, the relations of the state with the citizens will be primarily based on their ethnic origin. We need to have a, a state that will participate uh, efficiently uh, in the European uh, Union uh, as a member state that we are for the last uh, 10 years, and a state that will be implementing thoroughly EU legislation and the acquis communautaire throughout the island. We believe that it is possible to reconcile. We don't hear anything. Oh, you didn't hear anything until now from the beginning? <laughs> I need to start over, okay. <laughs> but um, uh, yes, uh, I was saying that uh, we believe that we, it is possible to reconcile the bicommunal, bizonal character of this federation and the political equality with those fundamental values and principles of the European Union and the implementation of EU legislation throughout the island. And it's not through exceptions and opting out that we are going to achieve this, but through the proper implementation of the European acquis. If we were to go the other way around, we would uh, create segregation and would uh, prevent, if you like, the constituent states of Cyprus to work together and create a thriving European democracy and a united economy 
which will stand its chances to be competitive in terms of the European Union. So uh, with this in mind, we started this new uh, effort for the settlement of the Cyprus problem uh, that uh, we have in, in front of us right now and we are working on. But uh, uh, we need also to bear in mind that uh, uh, the situation today is completely different than what it was some years ago. Uh, with the exception of the continuing uh, presence of occupation troops, all the rest has changed. Uh, the supposed enmity between Greek and Turkey Cypriots, which anyway was more perceived than uh, real, uh, today appears as something that has to do with the past. And uh, trust and confidence between the communities is uh, there, and uh, uh, very quickly it can be restored to its uh, previous uh, uh, levels. Uh, if we manage to have more people-to-people -people, uh, contacts. Uh, the second element is that uh, we believe that we are far beyond the problematic logic that permeated in the time of Cyprus independence of 1960, that uh, Cyprus and the settlement of Cyprus uh, was only there to fit into, uh, to serve and respect a certain Greco-Turkish balance. The Cold War reality of 1960, which served to preserve the above logic and left Cyprus in the middle of problems that went beyond its size and its ability to cope with, is not there anymore. You know, we believe that today uh, Cyprus can take its own stride and can go beyond this Greco-Turkish balance as an independent and uh, sovereign state. At the same time, uh, we believe that uh, there is another factor which uh, has completely changed through all those uh, developments, dramatic sometimes in Cyprus, we uh, came to more maturity in the country, and we st understand all of us, I believe on both communities, that you know the national identity is one thing, and then being citizens of a state is another thing. And uh, we cannot go back to this principle of nationality, was, which was the prevailing idea uh, many years ago. And, uh, to this, if you add the new geopolitical uh, situation that we're going in in our part of the world, we uh, understand that it is now high time for a unification, and most probably we have, we stand a much better chance to achieve reunification. Of course, for this to happen, we need to overcome some uh, also perceived ideas. Uh, many times one gets the impression that many Cypriots are willing hostages of the past. And it is not easy to change this mindset, but it is imperative. The Cyprus problem the, and the way it unfolded, as I was saying a, a minute ago, stood in the way of constructing a notion of being citizens of the Republic and uh, citizens of Cyprus. Now, I believe that uh, this has changed and people are ready to understand and accept that we preserve the ethnic origin and the identities of both communities, but we built a notion of Cypriot citizenship. The third element is that we need to get rid of any outside intervention. You know, <laughs> this has been the source of many problems of Cyprus. And uh, we need today to make everybody understand that only if the country can fly with its own wings and without 
external interference, we can have a settlement in Cyprus. The, st the geostrategic position I mentioned is also very important. You know, the discovery of hydrocarbons in uh, Cyprus and around Cyprus and the new geopolitical situation in the area, it's uh, a very important factor, which for some time worked in the negative direction, but now I believe that we can turn it into a positive uh, element. Uh, of course, it requires that uh, our relationship with Turkey stops to be a relationship of uh, uh, opposition and efforts by Turkey to threaten Cyprus when it tries to exploit uh, our natural, uh, natural resources or to neutralize uh, the existence of Cyprus and our position. Uh, but um, if we replace this for a new approach where we are going to be able to sort out the problem and find new avenues of uh, cooperation between uh, Cyprus, Turkey, Israel, and the whole Eastern Mediterranean, uh, then uh, it will be the best way forward. As I was saying before, uh, this geopolitical situation, the new geopolitical uh, situation, uh, has uh, also contributed to an enhanced American interest in our part of the world. And uh, we believe that this American interest, uh, it's not about, you know, uh, uh, how to say, stealing our hydrocarbons. Uh, it's about maintaining a predictable course, stability and predictability in the area, and making sure uh, that uh, uh, the broad uh, perception of uh, the American interests and of the Western interests are preserved in the area. The same applies to the uh, European Union. Cyprus is a member of the European Union for the last 10 years, and uh, today, uh, through a settlement in uh, if you like, in addition to the new geopolitical situation, Cyprus can play fully its role within the European Union, both as a bridge towards uh, the Middle East and the broader uh, Eastern Mediterranean, and it, as an alternative access, both in the direction of west towards east and in the direction of east towards the west. And of course, as I was saying, we believe that uh, the European Union uh, stands to gain a lot from the settlement in Cyprus because we are uh, the outer post of the Union in the Eastern Mediterranean and also when it comes to countries of the region and in particular Israel, Cyprus is the natural access towards the European Union. So uh, we believe that uh, uh, we have in front of us the parameters that will allow us now in this uh, new uh, effort to achieve results. Of course, uh, we are not there yet. You understand that we still have uh, an occupation army. We have hundreds of thousands of settlers that were brought in uh, by Turkey and we need to find ways to restore everyone's individual uh, human rights and freedom we will not accept any settlement that uh, does not take on board all those factors, but we believe that it is possible to have a fair settlement that uh, will allow all Cypriots to live in peace. To come now to a second part where I'm going to tell you just a few things about the, the current effort uh, that uh, is taking place in Cyprus. First, uh, let me tell you that uh, we have the feeling that all the parties involved have uh, more determination and commitment than before. And uh, this is true uh, for ourselves, and uh, President Anastasiadis made it clear since uh, his election 
this appears to be true also for the Turkish Cypriot leadership, and this is true also for Turkey. This is true for the European Union, for the United Nations, for the United States, and all other international uh, actors. Uh, and it is important also uh, in our part of the world, uh, and you know that one of the priorities of the American policy, for instance, is to restore a good working relation between Israel and Turkey, and this goes to a great extent through Cyprus as well. Turkey itself uh, appears to realize that, uh, you know, it's not through the traditional uh, mil militaristic approach towards Cyprus that we are going to move forward, and they seem to opt more for cooperation, economic cooperation after the settlement of the Cyprus problem, and uh, cooperation in terms of energy, and uh, possibly uh, in terms of uh, having, uh, you know, a route, an energy route going to Europe through Turkey. There is uh, another alternative of uh, a corridor uh, linking Israel, Cyprus, possibly tomorrow Lebanon, Greece, uh, with the European Union. And this, of course, will contribute to the energy security of the European Union and will enhance the strategic importance of our part of the world and of Cyprus itself. Now, uh, since uh, September, we have started a, a very uh, enhanced uh, and uh, serious effort, if you like, to solve the problem. We have spent uh, almost five months to have an agreed joint communique, but uh, I think it was worth it because we have, with the joint communique, a very solid basis of the content of the sought-after solution, and at the same time, we have an understanding of the methodology. Two months ago, we started fully-fledged negotiations, and uh, we uh, are uh, talking about the substance. We are negotiating very seriously. We are going through a process of uh, screening right now and of, uh, in a way, assessing the distance that separates the respective positions but uh, this is a necessary component of the process. And uh, without, uh, if you like, sounding uh, over-optimistic or, uh, if you like, uh, uh, nourishing the euphoria that uh, is uh, spreading sometimes, I would like to say that uh, we are on track, we are working, we are just at the beginning of the process, but uh, we have every reason to believe that uh, uh, we are going to move uh, forward, provided that we continue to have the political will on all sides. Uh, what changes this time around is also the fact uh, that uh, we are discussing, and this is part of the methodology, all the core issues and all the problems at the same time. And it is part of this new comprehensive approach that we had also the visits of the negotiators to Athens and Ankara, respectively. In order to, we all know that the key for the solution of some of the most important elements of the Cyprus problem lies in Ankara. So it's important to talk directly to them. Also, the fact that we are having on the table and we discuss in their interdependence all the issues can make the difference. Because until now, we had a kind of a sequential approach and as a result of this, in the past, you know, every time we were facing a difficulty or a refusal of the other side to discuss a particular issue, let's say territory or security or guarantees, etc., we were parking the issues. Mm -hmm. And uh, we had the feeling, as uh, former President, late President Kleridis was saying, that we are transforming the Cyprus uh, problem into an enormous parking lot. So, <laughs> so we need now to tackle all the issues, all the issues, and this is what we are going to do. So this, this is what is happening at the negotiating table. At the same time, we believe that we need some parallel tracks, some uh, initiatives that uh, will re-enhance 
the process and the results of those initiatives will be funneled into the process. So we need some confident building measures, some game changes, and the most important of this is the idea of having a pipe gauge around Varosha and Famagusta where the fenced area of, Famag of Varosha will be transferred to the UN in order to prepare for its return to its uh, legitimate inhabitants, if you like. And also, we're going to use the port of Famagusta for uh, free circulation of goods uh, of Turkey Cypriot origin within the European Union. And then we're going to implement the Ankara Protocol of the Customs Union of Turkey with the European Union, which will allow more uh, links uh, in the trade area in particular between uh, Cyprus and Turkey, the opening of ports and airports uh, to uh, Cyprus vessels and to Turkish vessels. And uh, also uh, the implementation of the Ankara Protocol will create another win-win situation because this will allow the unfreezing of eight chapters in the accession negotiations of Turkey. So we believe that this can make the difference and we count a lot both on the European Union to be ready to assume their own responsibility for the implementation of such uh, measures, but also of the United Nations to do the same. And we count a lot also on the American enhanced interest to move those parallel tracks forward. Last uh, but not least, we need this time round more of a bottom-up approach. Because uh, until now, uh, the efforts uh, for the solution of the Cyprus problem were taking place at the political level. And the last one was kind of UN initiative which resulted in a plan and in an arbitration. And uh, one of the reasons it failed, it was because we, the people were not on board. So now we need to get it right. There is no way we are going to have a repetition of the previous effort. There will not be any outside plan, no arbitration. The leaders will have to negotiate. They need to establish and draft the settlement. And for this to happen and have an end result which will go to referenda and be approved in separate simultaneous referenda by both communities, we need to make sure that people are on board. No political leader will go to the end unless he knows that he has the overwhelming support of the people. So uh, we need to start working as from now, and we have started working as from now with the civil society, with NGOs, with the business people. There are a lot of, a lot of initiatives that are going on, and we hope that uh, slowly, slowly, we are going to build the conditions, the organic conditions of peace, as Jean Monnet was putting it, to go back to our European discussions of two years ago. So, so with this, I will stop, and uh, I'm uh, at your disposal for any comments or questions you want to make. Thank you, Heather. Well, Mr. Bastard, thank you so much. Uh, that was the most hopeful conversation I have had in a very long time on this subject. So, uh, and, and I have to tell you, uh, as a European an analyst the last several weeks, I have not been optimistic about very much following the Ukraine crisis. So I, I thank you for giving us a bright uh, spot. Um, Again, I just want to remind colleagues this is an on-the-record discussion, and we're going to bring you into the conversation in, in just a, a few moments. Um, I would like to, to play the role of Doubting Thomas a little bit and talk a little bit about how the stars have aligned, because as hopeful as and encouraging this is that it's coming from the bottom up, this is a, a community-led process, not a top-down approach. You know, we, we can't not talk about what the Republic of Cyprus has gone through in the last year of a devastating economic crisis. The government is now in a minority government, having uh, one of the coalition partners, the Democratic Party, leaving because the February Declaration was signed. We, the external environment, Syria conflict, I, I'd love your reflections on how the uh, crisis in Ukraine and Crimea and the Russian element to this, if this has any 
play into that. While the stars are aligned internally, it feels geopolitically that there's so much going on uh, economically, militarily, politically, that could this have an impact? Or, or honestly, because this is within the communities, they're aligning what's going on, it's, it's slightly immune to the, to the geopolitics. And I'll let you respond, and then I have a few other follow-up questions. No, I think you are touching the core of the issue, but uh, to start by the, the last uh, comment you made, I believe that uh, exactly because we are going through a very troubled period, be it uh, Russia, Ukraine, uh, Crimea, etc., be it Syria, uh, because things are running a bit out of control there, we need somewhere to start by having, getting something right. And uh, from this point of view, I think uh, we managed in recent months to insulate a little bit the effort for the settlement in Cyprus for, from all those factors that are happening around. And uh, we believe that if we manage, we can provide the best possible way forward and pave the way to address other issues that are important and are lingering in this part of the world. So for the time being, at least, uh, we didn't see any negative effect on the process, either from the internal developments in Turkey, and uh, we all know what happened over the last uh, eight months, uh, nor from, I mean, what is happening now with the results of the municipal elections and uh, that they are about to start the campaign for the presidential elections, etc. So far, uh, we felt that there, there was a constant commitment and a strategic decision to move forward. We don't know how far this will go. We cannot predict. But what we can say is that uh, uh, in Cyprus, uh, the, if you like, the very difficult economic situation, the devastating crisis, uh, as uh, you mentioned it, that is going on for more than a year, yes, this had a negative effect. Yeah, first, uh, because the margin of maneuver is much more limited and people fear that, you know, at the end of the day, because you are weak economically, somebody will impose something on you. So they are very, very skeptical and uh, very concerned. And every time there is something, you no, know, it is examined, uh, you know, from <laughs> one hundredth point of view to in order to make sure that there is nothing wrong happening. But at the same time, everybody understands that where we to solve the problem, this will give a great boost into the economy of the country and will allow the economy of Cyprus to fully take its stride. So in the minds of people, there are both feelings. On the one hand, they are scared, but if we manage to convince them that what we are doing will be a balanced and fair settlement that will unlock the potential of the country, maybe they will be willing to go along. If you add the fact that uh, we had those discoveries of hydrocarbons in the uh, maritime zones of Cyprus and the prospects of cooperation with Israel in that regard and in many other issues, on many other issues, uh, the conditions for a brighter future are there, if you like, and I believe that this eventually uh, will uh, uh, help in uh, maintaining the, the impetus that we have now for the settlement of the Cyprus problem. The real difficulty is that so far, in spite of all the good intentions and the determination demonstrated by everybody, we have not seen any concrete results in the negotiation. Mm -hmm. Maybe it was expected because we are uh, at an initial stage, but you cannot talk about a settlement very soon unless uh, you have uh, agreement on issues like territory, like property, like governance, security, guarantees, 
uh, you know, the problem of the settlers, questions uh, of uh, how do you elect uh, the head of state and government, how do you govern the country, all those issues are open. So it's too early to say anything about uh, the results. We have no results, but there, there is commitment and determination. And the moment of truth uh, is close. Fits into my next question about sort of the sense of timing and timeline. It seems, from following your comments, that confidence building measures are going to have to be seen fairly quickly to, to sort of build in some of these early results to build mm -hmm. on the, the the positive rhetoric. But we're also looking at a, a fairly daunting uh, political schedule for Turkey: mm -hmm. presidential elections in August, general elections next year. It, it, this is on its own time, but is there are there some markers that progress will need to be seen at certain points, or it runs into sort of the tyranny of elections and mm -hmm. political cycles? Again, here, the, the feeling we're getting, and uh, I had discussed this issue during my visit in Ankara, was that, um, you know, nobody can predict 100%, but the commitment and the strategic decision of Turkey to walk towards a settlement will not be directly affected by the municipal elections or the uh, forthcoming presidential elections or what will happen next year. And uh, we have not seen, for the time being, any impact. Uh, the commitment remains. We need to see if we manage to insulate again the process from what is happening around. This would be a very good thing, and we hope this will be the case. At the same time, all of us, you know, we understand that uh, in international life, there are sometimes windows of opportunity. Those windows do not remain open forever. So there is a notion that we need to do our utmost to achieve results as soon as possible. What we cannot say is that, you know, we fix an artificial deadline. This does not make any sense. Only progress can determine the pace of the negotiation. But uh, uh, at the same time, we need to have a notion of urgency. I don't know uh, how many months uh, it will take, one year or two years, I don't know. But we all understand that uh, uh, this window will not stay open forever. So we have this in mind, all of us, and we are working. We believe that uh, the UN they are doing a good job in their good offices mission. We need more support also from the European Union and there, there is a divergence between ourselves and the Turkey Cypriot side because they don't want the involvement of the European Union. Uh, we believe that uh, it is in the interest of the negotiation and it is in the interest of Cyprus to have more EU involvement because we are members of the European Union. Uh, but uh, slowly, slowly, I believe we will manage to get uh, uh, the right process, if you like. Uh, and um, if possible, achieve fairly soon more concrete results that uh, will make, if you like, after a certain point, the process irreversible. And this will be the most crucial point. I don't know when this will happen, but we're working in this direction. Mr. Besser, my last question is on energy and on the energy resources. I understand the politics yes. of the energy. I'm wondering if the economics of the energy can meet the needs of the politics. Uh, and reading various uh, articles uh, about, you know, question of the amount of energy that's there, some of the challenges of whether it's uh, economically feasible to build LNG facilities or pipelines and things like that. How much to sort of the, the practicalities of the economics of bringing these resources to market or whatever the discoverable resources are there, how much will that ultimately impact uh, the, the negotiation? This is a very good question. I think uh, that uh, everybody has uh, in mind this dimension. And though we are not talking about this at the negotiating table, we know very well that uh, uh, 
if there is an enhanced uh, American interest, it's partly because of the energy issue, and if there is a change in the policy of Turkey towards Cyprus, again, it has to do with the energy issue and the new approach uh, Turkey is, seems to adopt in terms of uh, its, econom its economic weight in the area and uh, in uh, trying to build uh, more avenues of cooperation between the countries in the region. And the energy is key to this. Now, uh, Cyprus has, uh, for the time being, some uh, uh, confirmed discoveries of natural gas in the area between Cyprus and Israel. Those uh, reserves are important. They could cover our own needs for 60 years, internal needs. And you know that today Cyprus has the highest cost of energy in Europe. So uh, were it only to be for our national needs, this would be very important because if we manage to divide the cost of energy by two, we, are, uh, we can solve our economic problems. Mm -hmm. You know, we have destroyed the industrial tissue of the country, the industrial fabric, because since the 80s, you know, w at the time we were thinking it was the cost of labor, mm -hmm. but we discovered that it's mainly the cost of energy. So if we divide the cost of energy by two for our domestic needs already, this will be very, very important. But there is more than that. Uh, we are trying to find ways of cooperation between Cyprus and Israel in order to have joint exploitation of uh, natural gas. Possibly if uh, we have an agreement with Israel uh, the construction of an LNG facility in Cyprus will become feasible in the very near future. But uh, we uh, are waiting also for the results of other explorations by other companies in other blocks south of Cyprus by the French company Total and the Italian company Eni with very good prospects. So most probably, in a couple of years, we are going to have a very different picture. But even with what we have right now, I think there is enough material in order to build uh, something completely new. Potentially, with a very optimistic scenario, we can contemplate an LNG and uh, later in the future, even a pipeline that will link Israel, Cyprus, probably, uh, the reserves of Lebanon, uh, Cyprus, and Greece to Europe. Mm -hmm. And this will be a very important contribution to the energy security of the European Union, which, as you know, today is put into question uh, through the most predictable and reliable corridor that can exist because it only goes through members of the European Union. So, uh, but this is the future, we are not there yet. We don't uh, have a confirmed, uh, you know, uh, reserves uh, uh, in uh, the other blocks. What we have and we expect uh, to that the Noble Energy, where they made this discovery, they will have, uh, they will find additional quantities. But as I was saying, it's, al it's already very substantial. And uh, in this equation, there is also the question of what do we do with Turkey? Turkey has enormous energy needs and uh, they would like to find ways to cooperate with Israel on this and possibly with Cyprus. And this is a very fundamental incentive for them to solve the Cyprus problem because we all know that for uh, the cooperation in the energy field between Israel and Turkey, or Cyprus and Turkey, precondition is the settlement of the Cyprus problem. And uh, tomorrow, as I was saying, Lebanon, if they have discovered also natural gas, the day after tomorrow, maybe uh, the Palestinians, and apparently there were some indications that, uh, you know, in the sea outside uh, Gaza, there might be important reserves as well. So the whole equation might change slowly, slowly, 
And Cyprus, in this new situation, maybe for the first time in its history, is not in demand there. Mm. Everybody else needs Cyprus. And it does not happen very often to us. Usually, it's the other way around. <laughs> so, so this uh, will mean that uh, we can play a role, and the settlement should be such as to allow Cyprus to play this role. And I believe that there is a much better understanding on behalf of the United States of this importance of Cyprus right now. And this is why we have this enhanced American interest, which for the first time ever is separate from the Greco-Turkish dimension. You know, until now, and I suppose you are here long enough to listen to previous interventions where everybody was saying, you know, we need to solve the Cyprus problem because this is a thorn in Greco-Turkish relation. E even President Obama went to Istanbul last year to mention this story. And, uh, you know, uh, all they were saying, you know, this is a problem that uh, needs to be sorted out because it affects uh, the southeastern dimension of NATO and this kind of thing. Now, the American policy towards Cyprus and the Eastern Mediterranean has some autonomy with regard to Greece and Turkey. And it is because of the energy uh, dimension. Fascinating. All right, we'd love to welcome you into this conversation. If you have a question, we have microphones. If you could please raise your hand and uh, uh, please give us your name and your affiliation. We like our questions provocative and tough and our comments short. So uh, with that, uh, please, uh, would welcome any questions. Yes, sir, right down the front. Good afternoon, Mr. Ambassador. Nicola Regakis, president of the American Hellenic Institute. You touched on a lot of subject matters here today. And obviously, you said there is a window and there's an opportunity uh, that you mentioned. Obviously, you went and visited in Ankara. There was a counterpart who went and visited in Greece. Nonetheless, though, you also mentioned that Turkey still is a key element in this whole thing. And unfortunately, it was alluded to that through the prism of so many other geopolitical factors has always been defined how people review and look at the Cyprus problem. I unfortunately feel that's still the case, notwithstanding some of the previous comments. Having stated that, you're here in Washington, you're gonna meet with people, I believe in administration, State Department and others. Two, two quick uh, points, one, questions rather. One, can you please tell us what you would like to see more succinctly from the United States administration, from the Obama administration, moving forward in these negotiations. And frankly, Turkey is still the key in this, as you mentioned. So what do you want to see in some succinct points from Turkey moving forward in these negotiations? Because as we've seen in the last year or so, things in Turkey, with Mr. Erdogan being very unpredictable, even though he just you know, had a major landslide victory again, and now we have another election coming up, you know, and every time you turn around, there's another election coming up in Turkey, which is part of the prism of how the West views this issue. But again, they are important to this. Moving forward, what do you want to see from these two major players, the United States and Turkey? Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Lalengagis. This is a very, very interesting question, both of them. First, let me start by saying that uh, what I'm trying to sell here is the fact that Cyprus is in this part of the world, maybe along Israel, a beacon of stability and predictability. And the West should be able to rely on us. But this is a factor which is of paramount importance and has to continue to be there. So what the United States need to do is to integrate into their understanding and approach towards the Cyprus problem. This need to have Cyprus remaining as an autonomous and independent actor and player. We shouldn't, as I was saying before, through a bad settlement, neutralize Cyprus and put it in the hands of Turkey. So, and the same, exactly the same message applies to Turkey. We need the United States to convince Turkey that it is not through trying to control Cyprus or 
to say that they have rights over Cyprus, that we can find a settlement to the Cyprus problem. We cannot go on like that. We cannot have, you know, those arrangements of security and guarantees that are things of the past. Today we have a country which is a member of the European Union and which has the right to fully play its part in the region. So that's it in a nutshell, what we, I would like to see. And from the United States, we would like to see exactly this, that we need to preserve Cyprus as an alternative route from west to east and from east to west, and decisions to be concerning Cyprus and concerning our future and concerning our resources to be taken by us and us alone. Can I follow up on yes. that? So I, I'd like to pull out, um, and maybe you can provide a little more detail on the, the role of the EU. Who in the EU is driving the, the, the policy and, and the engagement? Uh, that's sort of question one. And how does this, the sort of the U.S.-Turkey question, I'll ask it, how does the EU-Turkey relationship, and you mentioned sort of the, the difference of opinion yes. on the role of the EU, how does that play out here? Uh, now that process is, the EU-Turkish process, accession process has a little bit of life breathed back into it, but it's not going very far, obviously, because of the domestic uh, situation within Turkey okay. today. Okay, this is a perennial question. The EU, which number to die? <laughs> okay. Internal question. That's right. That's right. But 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 uh, indeed, uh, it is important to see what is happening, and uh, what we have today uh, is, uh, as I was saying, uh, kind of awareness, increased awareness in all uh, EU member states and all of our partners concerning both the importance of Cyprus in terms of being the bridge towards uh, our part of the world and also in potentially in terms of energy security. So, uh, but this is the member states. Institutionally, you know, the problem of the European Union is that you have various institutions that are on an equal footing and each one of them uh, is very jealous of their powers and prerogatives. And uh, let me tell you from my experience as president of the <laughs> Council of the European Union that the most challenging task I was facing was to make the institutions work together in synergy and osmosis. And this is the main role of the rotating presidency of the Union right now. Uh, having said that, what we have is uh, a representative of the Commission who is part of the UN Good Offices mission and uh, who uh, is playing a role in trying to be helpful in order to have uh, uh, a settlement that will comply with the acquis communautaire. And as far as we are concerned, we want more of this and we want an enhanced role of this representative. Then there is the fact that the European Commission always works in the occupied part of Cyprus with a very far-reaching program of uh, assistance in order to help the Turkey Cypriot community. And this is run by the commission. And uh, part of it is by communal projects as well. And maybe tomorrow there will be, there will be some elements concerning the full implementation of the Aki Communautaire throughout the island. Then we have, of course, the work that is being done by the European Parliament, and we have a renewed interest also by the Council and by uh, the European Council on, on Cyprus. Uh, you know, on the one hand, we all understand that this is uh, of paramount importance, but there is some suspicion on the part of Turkey because we are members, Turkey is not a member. Their prospects to join are very gloomy. Uh, to be frank and honest with you, in my discussions with Ankara, uh, my interlocutors were telling me that they don't believe that Turkey will eventually join, but uh, they want to be on track and uh, play this game of accession negotiations, but without believing that at the end they will join. Mm -hmm. At the same time, what was very important was to realize 
that they were accepting that for the Turkey Cypriot community, being in the European Union as part of the reunified Cyprus was important. Mm -hmm. And that we can find there, if you like, the necessary tools in order to have a fair and workable settlement. So this is what I can say about this. As you were talking about the, uh, the implementation of the Ankara pro Protocols, the thought that I came to my mind is if actually there was implementation by both sides of the Ankara Protocols, that would place a very daunting challenge before the European Union about moving a lot of chapters forward mm -hmm. that have been blocked. Absolutely, so, absolutely. With that. Yes, questions. We have one in the back, Caroline, right there. Thank you, Ambassador. My name is Katerina Soku with Greek Daily Catherine. I have two questions for you. One is, what would the Aki Communitaire, if it was uh, enforced in uh, the Turkish Cypriot side, uh, entail, and why would Turkey not want that? And uh, the second one would be, if uh, a Turkish army uh, is not acceptable, uh, would there be another solution that the Greek Cypriots uh, would uh, feel more comfortable with, and what would that be? A UN presence, a e an EU presence, uh, or nothing at all? Thank you. I'm not sure I got uh, your second question well, but uh, can you repeat the second question, please? So if there, if uh, uh, my question would be, if there wasn't uh, a Turkish army anymore uh, mm -hmm. in Cyprus. Okay, uh, now I got it, okay. okay. Thank you. <laughs> Okay. Now, no, on the first one, I mean, it's very clear that uh, when Cyprus uh, acceded uh, to the European Union in 2004, the whole island became member of the European Union, but the acquis communautaire, the EU legislation, was suspended in the part which is not under the control of the government. If we find a settlement, this suspension will be lifted. Of course, we will need some transitional periods, but the idea is to obtain. So we are not willing to discuss permanent derogations or exceptions. We need to have a reunified country, a reunified economy, and the freedoms of the European Union being implemented throughout the island. Otherwise, we are going to, cre to create kind of bandustans within Cyprus and it's not helpful, and it's not in the interest of either community. So uh, we insist a lot on this dimension, and we believe that uh, the implementation of the acquis of the European Union is the best guarantee for the security and the workability of the settlement. Now, when it comes to the Turkish army, of course for us uh, its withdrawal is a sine qua non, and we cannot accept that there will be any foreign troops on Cyprus, nor that any country will have the right to intervene in the internal affairs of Cyprus. We don't believe that we need any guarantees on any, any international protection. We are grown-ups. I mean, uh, there is no other country that has these kind of uh, situations. We believe that we have a system of collective security through the Security Council which is more than sufficient in case there is a threat to the peace. And uh, we don't believe that we need to have anything more than that. So uh, it is true that from time to time, some other ideas are being uh, floated, but uh, you know, either to replace uh, you know, the Turkish contingent with a NATO contingent or with a European contingent, etc. Personally, I believe that none of those uh, I mean, ideas uh, is good. I believe that all we need to do is just to finish with these kind of things and allow Cyprus to be a normal European state which will be able to dispose in a sovereign way, uh, you know, its territory, the use of its territory for the needs both of the European Union and possibly of the United Nations. You know that now, for instance, we are helping a lot the United Nations for the Syrian operation in order to get rid of the chemical weapons. So imagine if after a settlement, uh, Cyprus is not able to embark on this uh, kind of operations because we will need the approval of foreign actors. I mean, it does not make any sense. 
we believe that uh, in order for us to fully take our stride, we need to get rid of this kind of anachronistic approaches to the questions of security and guarantees. Two questions, right? And we'll just take them together, if that's all right. Kerede Gide Mavroyani, my name is Perry. Um, I'm from Nicosia, Cyprus. Um, my question to you is more um, based on the actual natural gas. You say that we can use it as a tool to our advantage, but in actuality, it seems like it's more of a hostage to the European Union um, to make sure that we can pay back our debts to make sure that we can actually find a solution um, and make sure that we don't accept Russia as our ally again. Th that's what it seems to me, at least. Mm -hmm. um, at the same time, I also want to ask you, what do you think about, uh, specifically for the settlement, with actual Turkish citizens on the occupied part of Cyprus that have been, over the years, displaced from Turkey into Cyprus, will they be integrated with full rights? Will they be part of this federal solution? Will, uh, how would that work for us? Yes, please. I'm John Koichev, former delegate to the United Nations Environment Program, and I have two questions. The first is the property. It seems to me that there is a tendency, uh, well, as we know, before the occupation, most of the population in northern Cyprus, as they call it, was Greek. And the people was displaced from property. And the sincere desire of the Greek part is to have this property returned. And there is a tendency, in my opinion, on the Turkish side to compensate. And on the other hand, in the Republic of Cyprus, the law is that if you come from any place like the Republic of Papua New Guinea and pay uh, buy a property which is more than 300,000 euro, you become automatically permanent resident. Yes. And this is an issue that I would like to know. <coughs> is that so, or how shall we? It's a very ticklish issue, the property. Mm -hmm. And the second question is, I understood that the liquefied natural gas has two avenues. One is the pipelines, the floating platforms, and then the liquefied natural gas ports. And the question is, what is the role of the port of Vasilikos, Vasiliko? Mm -hmm. And is it possible that while we develop the platforms, we could put into operation ports like Vasiliko? and accept liquefied natural gas from countries like Norway in order to supplement the need for energy. Thank you. Accept from, from For who? example, from Norway. From Norway? Yeah, Norway can easily. Y yes, but uh, in, in what form? It will come as liquefied? Liquefied, mm -hmm. and that would be unloaded in Vasiliko, mm -hmm. while the work continues. Mm -hmm. And who are okay. the major protagonists from the co corporations. There is one single American company interested, but now the newspapers say China is interested, Russia is interested. Mm -hmm. Of course, South Korea will bring the platforms. Mm -hmm. And just general economic mm -hmm. question. Now, very interesting questions. Uh, first, uh, let me say something about uh, uh, natural gas. I don't believe that uh, we are hostages of this. To the contrary, the discovery of uh, natural gas, you know, uh, allows uh, Cyprus to become a bit of a player and eventually manage first to solve our own energy needs. And, you know, we have a commitment with the European Union that normally this year we need to use natural gas for the production of electricity and we are not going to be able to fulfill this commitment and we will ask for an extension. So we need uh, natural gas for our own needs immediately. So whether this will be possible through our own reserves or whether we're going to have to strike and deal with uh, another country, be it Israel or be it uh, somebody else we don't know, most probably, uh, the level of cooperation with Israel is such that uh, most probably we're going to have Israeli gas to cover our domestic needs. But this is, at the end of the day, a provisional, a transitional solution until we bring the natural gas through a pipeline from Block 12 to Vasilikon and build the LNG, for which, as I was saying, for the time being, 
we don't have the quantities, so we need additional quantities from other reserves, be it Israeli or the uh, quantities we expect to discover in other blocks, and we are going to know in the next couple of years, most probably, uh, I mean, the prospects are very, very uh, positive. But um, it has to be clear, however, that uh, the question of the natural gas is not part of the program of economic recovery of Cyprus. So if we manage, it will be a plus. But our program does not contain any clause having to do with natural gas. So the idea for us is that, okay, in the new situation after the crisis, we need to build a new economic model in Cyprus. And certainly, as I was alluding before, if we manage to divide the cost of energy by two through our own national, uh, natural gas, you understand that this would allow us to build a new economic model that will be based on real economy, which we don't have right now. So it is of utmost importance, and this will uh, create a new future for the economy of Cyprus, which for the time being relies more on business, on services, on tourism, and on shipping. So industrial, not much. And uh, it is important. Energy, every business people in Cyprus will tell you that if they have moved their business, industrial business out of Cyprus, it was not because of the cost of labor, but mainly because of the cost of energy. And we pay the highest cost in energy in the European Union. So uh, when it comes to settlers, uh, of course, our position is that, uh, you know, without questioning the individual demarche of any person which tries to find a better future for himself and his family. And this was the main motivation of many people that came from Turkey. At a collective level, if this is a result of a deliberate policy to implant settlers by hundreds of thousands, this is a completely different situation. And this is a war crime, and it is defined as such by international conventions. So our position is that the settlers have to return to Turkey. Of course, if this position of principle is accepted, then we are going to be ab able to deal in a humane way the particular cases. And you know, there are people uh, that uh, uh, were born in Cyprus, there are mixed marriages. Uh, it's not about, you know, massive expulsions. It's about finding a way to sort this problem out without having the settlers being part of the people that will vote in a referendum. We cannot, if you like, allow foreigners to decide the future of our country. So this has to be very, very clear. Now, on the question of the communities and the intermingling of the people, I'm very happy you raised this because this exactly was the situation be before 74. You know, the two communities were living together throughout the island, and it was a forceful separation after 74. And of course, uh, the idea through a settlement is to restore the rights of everybody, the right to return to the their place of origin, and the right to recover their property through restitution. Of course, uh, the Turkish position was initially a global exchange of property and start again from zero. But uh, more and more, I think we come to grips, they come to grips with the idea that we need to recognize property rights and it is up to the owner, the dispossessed owner, to decide about his property. Possibly he will decide, uh, you know, to go back, to take back part of it and opt for compensation for another part. But the decision, the final decision, has to be taken by the dispossessed owner. This is our position. The Turkish Cypriot position is that the priority should be given to the current user. So, and you understand we are far apart on this, and we need to find a way to reconcile those positions. 
there is, there are uh, in place uh, the Pinero principles on property restitution that were established by the United Nations. These principles uh, are very firm on the right of the dispossessed owners to have restitution of their property, and only in case this is materially impossible, you can go towards exchange, compensation, and other remedies. Uh, what is materially impossible has to be defined very strictly. For instance, if on your property there was a motorway which has been built, it's very difficult to take it back. And then you would go for something else, or a hospital or something. But otherwise, you need uh, to restitute the property to of the people. Now, on uh, the pipeline and the LNG in Vasilikos, as I was saying, uh, there is some delay there because in order for foreign companies to invest in an LNG plant, they need to know that they have the quantities in order to make it profitable. The quantities are not there yet. What we discovered is enough for our domestic needs, it's enough for um, some exports, but they are not sufficient in order to make uh, an LNG plant viable. So we need additional gas. This gas might come from Israel, where they have confirmed reserves much more important than ours. It might come tomorrow from Lebanon, or it might come from the results of additional explorations that are taking place in south of Cyprus by the French company Total and the Italian company Eni. Now, uh, the existing discovery in the block 12 of the exclusive economic zone of Cyprus uh, is a contract between Cyprus and the American company uh, Noble Energy. And uh, Noble Energy uh, has uh, uh, an agreement with the Israeli company Delek. So those two companies are working together and they can provide the natural gas we need in Cyprus. But before they do the necessary investment, they prefer to wait and know whether we are going to build an LNG or not. Because if we are going to build an LNG, you have another kind of a pipeline which will cost, let's say, approximately uh, $650 million to build. Uh, and you can take the gas to the, the LNG plant. If you want to cover the domestic market, you add a very small pipeline to the big one with an additional cost of only $70 million, and you can cover, cover the domestic needs very easily. So it's very cost effective. But in order to build it, you need to know that you have the big picture. So this is how it works. Then there are other options that are being studied. Uh, one of them is uh, the so-called CNG, which is compressed uh, nat natural gas. There are some Canadian uh, companies that are in the vanguard of this, but this is very easy, and you can go over a reserve and then plug the ship and then just uh, take the gas and you go and you plug it uh, at the terminal and you take it out and then you go back. And this is very easy, but this is a method that has been tested, but has not yet been commercially used anywhere. So we are studying these various options, and along with the Israelis. The Israelis have uh, uh, also a floating LNG uh, plant, but it's a small one. And we will see what will happen in the, in the coming months. We are going to see clearer. The fact is that there is also an interest on the part of Turkey to have uh, possibly CNG or LNG from Israel. But ideally, Turkey and everybody know that if there is a settlement in Cyprus, the most profitable way is to have a pipeline going from Israel to Cyprus and from Cyprus to Turkey. This is the most economical one. Uh, if not, and if there are sufficient quantities in the future, 
we might contemplate, as I was saying, a pipeline between Israel, Cyprus, Greece, Italy, Europe. So everything is open. We need to see. It's too early. Thank you. We'll take one last question. Hello, my name is Stephen Kokoris. I'm with the American Hellenic Institute. Thank you very much for coming here today and speaking. Uh, my question has to do with uh, the ghost city of Arosha. You briefly touched upon that. I would just like you to comment on how negotiations with the Turkish Cypriots is going on there and future aspirations or plans that will come as of the future? You know, we consider the question of uh, Varosha Famagusta as a very important uh, game changer in the process for solving the Cyprus problem. It's not just uh, an ordinary confidence building measure because what this uh, proposal entails, if it were to be accepted, it has, uh, as I was saying before, four elements. One is the transfer of the ghost city of Varosha, the fenced area, to the United Nations in order to prepare for its return to its Greek Cypriot inhabitants. The use of the port of Famagusta for freedom of uh, movement of goods within the European Union, the implementation of the Ankara Protocol, and the freezing of the eight chapters that have been frozen by the Council of the European Union exactly because of the refusal of Turkey to implement the Ankara Protocol. Now, by transferring Varosha to the United Nations, what you do is that you allow you know, 30,000 Greek Cypriot displaced persons to return to their homes. Then they recover their property. Then you give an important boost to the negotiating process because you send a very strong signal that this is the end game. And of course, this first area of Varosha cannot operate in isolation. It has to work along with a master plan for the broader Famagusta Varosha area because it has to be economically viable. We ha and we have three areas there. There is the fenced area of Varosha, which is the one which is empty and has to be returned back to its Greek Cypriot inhabitants. And then we had the old city of Famagusta within the walls which is inhabited by Turkish Cypriots, and then we had the area north of Famagusta. All three areas have to operate together in a master plan in order to have synergy, and in order to have you know, a sewage system, to have a new architecture. Uh, most of the buildings are derelict, and they need reconstruction, and they need to operate together. And through this package, you can have a lot of trust and confidence being built and you will have private sector involvement because if you just transform the fenced area of Varosha to an imprisoned area with controlled access, etc., nobody will go to invest. You need a more broad approach. So we believe that where we to manage this and we count a lot on civil society and initiatives that were taken locally by the municipalities and by business people. Were we to move forward with this package, we might have the beginning of the solution of the Cyprus problem through this. Well, Mr. Messer, let me begin by saying thank you. It's absolutely clear we need a resolution to the Cyprus problem, and we are very happy that you are the point person to help help bring some of that resolution. Thank you for sharing with us in a very candid and open manner the process, the dynamics, the opportunities, the challenges. Thank you very much to our embassy colleagues. Uh, thank you for our partnership here uh, and, and allowing us to have this very frank and open conversation. And okay, so you visit us every two years. We can. 
increase that probably to every year. And I hope you'll come back and give us an important update on where the process is. And again, thank you. This is, well, the challenges are daunting, and your last comment n tells us how daunting the challenges remain. We are going to be very hopeful that uh, we see some very tangible progress in this very important part of the world very soon. Please join me in thanking the ambassador for his comments.